is that sufficient itself sufficient in itself to convert 370 into an unamendable or untouchable provision let me assume Malaj, that it is always something more required by a parliamentary intervention in india post independence to convert that which was essentially temporary into a permanent provision let's assume Malaj, that it is amendable for the sake of argument then Malaj, how is to be amended you can't even initiate a bill your losses will remember that you can't even initiate a bill Forget about anything else. Well, the government of India never expressed a contrary opinion throughout. But didn't it have to take place through a process of amending the Indian constitution itself? No. To convert the, reason, the character of 370. Well, let, let, all right. Well, now your lordships are again going back on the issue of temporary nature. The three options that Sheikh Abdullah spoke about, namely either of joining Pakistan, yes. acceding to India, or remaining independent, they gave up the first and the third option. That's correct. They decide the the of the the, uh, the ultimate decision was to stay within the dominion of India, but subject to the safeguards of 370. That's right. And therefore, according to you, 370 assumes a permanent character, irrespective of the nature of the provision which is envisaged in the Indian Constitution. And that's what Sheikh Abdullah said in his speech that look, if this relation that still begs one question. Yeah. As to whether it was enough that the Jammu and Kashmir Constituent Assembly proceeded on that basis. Put 370, which was envisaged to be a temporary provision, be converted into a permanent provision merely by the proceedings of the JNK Assembly? Or was there some further act required from the Indian Constitution, either in the form of a constitutional amendment, well, by virtue of which 370 would cease to have a temporary character but have a permanent character? in implementation of the wishes of the Jammu and Kashmir Constituent Assembly. Well, the government of India never expressed a contrary opinion throughout. But didn't it have to take place through a process of amending the Indian Constitution itself? No. To for convert the, reason, the character of 370. Let, 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 all right. Well, now your lordships are again going back on the issue of temporary nature. That temporary nature is, a, is, a, is, a, is, not, is not part of the Article 370. It's not part of a... It's a, it's a, it's a it's, it's not a part of 370, mother. In fact, Muzaffar Beg says we didn't even know about it. That's why I want to read Muzaffar. Mr. Sibyl, there are two ways that we could really lead into this discussion. One, that though placed in part 21, Article 370 was never intended to be a temporary provision. That's one. That's one layer of reasoning, which is what you are you are you are advancing. Two, that though it was temporary. The reason why it was placed in a temporary provision of the constitution was pending the decision of the constituent assembly of Jammu and Kashmir. And therefore, it was given the character of a temporary provision because the views of the constituent assembly of JNK were still to be elicited. Right. Third, the, 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 that's the second argument. We accept that for the purpose of hypothesis. The difficulty, of course, which we have to face is this. Assuming that that was why it was placed as a temporary provision, because the views of the JNK Constituent Assembly were still to be elicited. And you also take your point that the JNK Constituent Assembly decided to accede to India and reaffirm the accession to India, subject to the safeguards of Article 370. Is that sufficient itself, sufficient in itself to convert 370 into an unamendable or untouchable provision? Let me assume, Malaj, that it is always not. something more required by a parliamentary intervention in India post independence to convert that which was essentially temporary into a permanent provision. Let's assume, Malaj, that it is amendable for the sake of argument. Then, Malaj, how is to be amended? The constitution must provide a solution, no, Malaj? You, I'll assume, Malas, for the moment that it is amendable. Then how do the constitution, the constitution of India must provide a solution for that? Once we concede, Mr. Sibyl, that concede in the sense for the purpose of the, yeah, we are the We're not putting yeah, anything in your mouth, yeah. not at all. So I don't misunderstand that. Once we accept the fact that 370 is subject to the amending power under 368, then equally 370 provides for a modal or modality out of modality through which 370 itself would come to an end. Well, let's see 370 then, Malaz, and see what modality is. That modality can't be to convert a legislative assembly into a constituent assembly by definition through an executive act under 367 1. 
then well, let's, we have to find the modality within the constitution, not outside it, not vested in an executive power of the union. That cannot be. So if your lordship puts to me and rightly that something more had to be done under the constitution of India, we'd like to know what is that something more. But 373, 370 bracket 3, itself specifies the conditions in which the abrogation can take place. Which is, which is the constituent assembly must, 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 uh, 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 it must be on the recommendation of the constituent assembly. So it gives the solution. That is in line with the federated nature of this provision. This is complete federation, because we are quasi-federal qua other states. But these are purely federal qua Jammu and Kashmir, because the residuary power vests mothers in the state. So if you say, mother, that C-70 sub Article 3 provides that solution, well, that is provided, certainly, but upon the recommendation of the Constituent Assembly. And therefore, according to you, the power is completely lost once the JNK Constituent Assembly let comes me, to an end. Let me even not go that far. I'll assume that there is some power available. It may be 368. Let's say, I, I, it's hypothetical. We're not concerned with it. No, Mr. Simple, no, no when, you, when you argue, then we'll have to take one. 360 years is power to amend the constitution. That's that's certainly there. Yeah. Now, when we look at 370 clause 3, now the issue would be whether 368 power is still available to amend the constitution. But your lordship is not concerned with it in this matter. No, it is. It's very, very crucial. Because once we accept the fact that parliament as a sovereign lawmaking body has the power to amend everything, including 368. Yeah, uh, C70. Uh, sorry, th uh, including 370. 370. Yeah. Then any amendment of 370 may be subject to criticism on the ground of morality, but not power. No, but it's not an action. Maybe it's a political argument, but not a power. It's not an argument of constitutional power. It's not action under 368. Your lordships are not going to hypothetically say this is an action under 368 when 360 has not been invoked. But then, likewise, the exercise of power under 370 bracket 3, can it not be then criticized? It's a question of criticizing it as a, as a political as a, as a political criticism. But it's a, is it a is it an but argument of the absence of power? Where is that in 370? And the that court power? is really is, the court is concerned with either the existence or the absence of power, right? Not that I should ask your lordships. Where is that power in 370 that says that 368 you can do it under 360? So 368 is the power to amend the, the constitution. Government. We are not. Con are we concerned with that here? I'm, I'm sorry, Maraj. You require two thirds. You represent. There are independent avenues. You have the power to amend. Maraj, you have the power within 370 to abrogate. But Maraj, in that independent avenue, must conform to the provisions of the Constitution. Well, an independent avenue, do all the provisions of the Constitution, no avenue at all. Uh, Mr. Sibyl, for the timing, if we ignore the proviso to clause three, in fact, the clause three itself, independent of the proviso gives the power to the president itself to abrogate 370. No. If we forget about the sorry. provide. I'm sorry to say that. But I, 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 I'm really just sorry. Three, three, there is a provide once again. Just three, you can't exercise again. that power without the proviso. No, the proviso is something different. We're examining the proviso independently. <laughs> but independent but of the proviso. Clause 370 comes into play on the recommendation of the Constituent Assembly. Your Lordship is putting it the other way around. It comes on the recommendation of the constituent assembly that the president will exercise power, not the other way around. That's why I said you can't even initiate a bill. Your lordship will remember that. You can't even initiate a bill. Forget about anything else. Another problem is that then we would be redrafting the substantive part of clause 3 to postulate that the power under the substantive provision of clause 3 can be exercised so long as the constituent assembly of JNK is in existence. In which case, will the proviso not swallow up the main provision? But that's what it says, that in, unless that recommendation is there, you can't exercise your power. President can't exercise power under 370, sub-article 3. It says so. Well, as you will have to interpret it on its plain terms, Malaz, and the lordships have said it not once, but several times over. And it's a provision which, in essence, is a provision of federalism. It's at the heart of federalism, is this, Mothers. Yes, it's, of course, it's a precondition. There's no doubt about it.
I mean, whatever sophistry may happen can't can't happen in this way.